out, everyone, and welcome to No Boundaries. I'm Laura McGoldrick. Very excited to have two gentlemen with me zooming in from India. They are busy. The IPL is crazy, but we are loving watching it here on Sky Sport. I've got the wonderful Mike Hesse and the fabulous Simon Dool uh, in Mumbai, I believe you both are. Um, Hess, welcome back. Dooley, for the first time, so great to have you with us. How are you getting on over there? You are flat stick. You're doing all the games. Man, you must love cricket. Not sure Hess and I have ever been in for like that, but it's very nice. Thank you, Laura. Um, <laughs> crazy busy, but good times. Really good times. Absolutely. In the game's great comp at the moment. It's really tight. It is an interesting competition, and there's plenty happening. Lots of new rules, watching them sort of bed in as the competition progresses. Hess, um, from a coaching perspective, how much have you enjoyed all the new rules and regulations that, that have come in, and you liking the way or the state of the competition? Because the games are so exciting. Some of them are going right down to the wire. It, it's just good cricket on display. Yeah, it is, Laura. And I think that the new rules do have a part to play in that. I think the impact rule probably brings everybody closer together. Uh, I think if you're able to take wickets in the power play previously, you could probably squeeze through the middle and um, and probably run away with the game a little bit. I, I think the impact rule, for, from a broadcast perspective, has made it incredibly interesting. And I mean, the, the amount of last ball, last over finishes, I mean, it just happens every night, to be fair. Um, from a, I guess, a player development coaching perspective, I'm not a huge fan of it, um, to be fair. I think it, if I was the Indian... Um, if I was, yeah, if I was the Indian coach uh, trying to find someone in my top six who could bowl the odd over here or there, um, they're not even getting a look in. So it's not great for development of Indian all-rounders. But I mean, uh, in terms of the competition, it's a, it's a great watch. Um, Dooley, I'd love to get your thoughts on on the uh, the New Zealand players and and the fact that they haven't really played as key a role as we've seen in the past. We know about Trent Bolt, a lot's been made of him in those first overs. You know how he gets his wickets; he likes to do that. But really, I mean, Devon Conway, yes, batting very well. Mitchell Santner, quiet. Lockie Ferguson, quiet. Glenn Phillips just came in to play really the other night. Um, Tim Southey, just the two matches. Bracewell, the two matches. None for Finn Allen, and of course, losing Williamson up front was uh, challenging. So. Why, why do you think the Kiwis haven't played such a big role in this IPL? Um, look, Devon's been brilliant. Conway's been uh, out of Chennai. I thought Mitch that was unlucky. I, I thought he bowled beautifully in the three games that he got uh, up front. And then uh, Tekshana arrived. And I guess a couple of ordinary games. And I thought they may have brought Santner back. But since those two first two games for Tekshana, he's actually been pretty good. And he's also got Jadeja to get past, who's a local gun. So he's doing the same sort of role as Mitch might do. That, that that makes it pretty tough for him. Lockie and Tim have just when they did get a couple of opportunities, didn't bowl well. Um, so you know, hence you don't get too many opportunities in your franchise if you, if you have a couple of bad games. Glenn Phillips um, probably fighting for that spot um, with Harry Brook. They dropped Harry Brook the other night. Phillips has made an impression instantly, so he's going to play the rest of the games. Also, I'll uh, tell you why Braces is not playing. It's pretty tough to get into that side as a batter. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when you've got the likes of Maxwell and Fuff, um, yeah, sporadic performances from, from the Kiwis. Conway, just brilliant. Uh, outside of that, it's just been a little hit and miss. OK, so, um, Hiss, if you're at New Zealand Cricket right now and, you know, they release, obviously, you know all too well, they release the players to go and play IPL, you look at what's happened with the Black Caps who have played Pakistan, just finished their series in Pakistan, I'd say not the most successful um, series, but, I mean, obviously, the numbers would suggest it wasn't, but they did put in some good performances here and there. What are you thinking from a New Zealand cricket perspective, having seen how the Kiwis have performed in the IPL, given we've got a World Cup there not too far away, and then you look at the Pakistan series and international, Judy, what would you what would you say? How would you be feeling if you're New Zealand cricket right now? I mean, it was an opportunity to to test the bench strength, I guess, and, and probably from a selection point of view, those backup players it gives you an opportunity to to see who's next in line. And and to be fair, the, the same people perform. So I don't think there's any surprises. You know, Daryl Mitchell, highest run scorer. Tom Latham uh, was very good again. Will Young probably promoted himself um, in terms of you know average 48. Uh, played a couple of innings of, of real substance at the top. Good strike rate. He's probably one player who would have left that tour uh, in a better position than he arrived from a batting perspective, and, and he will certainly come into the reckoning uh, come the World Cup selection. Uh, from a bowling point of view, you know, it's, it's Matt Henry and, and Adam Milne again. Um, probably those are the two standouts. Um, you know, each side he had his moments with the ball. Um, you know, uh, Shipley had one good game, but, but outside of that, I mean, Henry was... You pretty much got what you expected from those 
those ready-made performers. So I don't think New Zealand cricket would have left and gone, OK, we've found ourselves two or three more players. You know, Chapman was exceptional in the T20s, probably didn't quite grab his opportunities in the one days, but I still think he's that explosive player as a backup who's certainly worth considering in the one-day game because he's one of those guys that can turn a game on its head. So I like the look of him, but outside of that, I don't think there was too many, too much of an upside uh, other than getting some game time into some less experienced players. What do you think, Dooley? Yeah, very similar, to be honest. Um, you know, the, the tried and true performers uh, that we know about, that we know can consistently perform at this level or at the top level, uh, pretty much did what we were expected of them. I was impressed with Chapman's um, growth. I, I thought under, even under, under Mike's sort of tenure, he might have got one or two more opportunities. The, the timing just wasn't quite right for him. And, and I think at times, and I've thought as well, that he's probably lacked a little bit of that big game awareness. So I was pleased to see when he did get an opportunity that he did um, perform at the top level because that's that's been my query uh, about him, I guess. So, you know, you're missing probably seven to eight of, of the frontline players. So all in all, as a tour, I think it was relatively successful. It's a very good Pakistan side. We have to remember that. But, you know, I'm, I'm with Hess. We didn't really find out anything extra about those guys that we, we probably didn't know before. Good first class cricketers. Have they got what it takes to perform at the next level up? Mm, the jury's still out on it. OK, so if we break it down and say, OK, New Zealand has seven ODIs left until the start of the One Day World Cup later this year, are we concerned that we still haven't found those extra players? Or what are, what are we thinking there, Hess? So I'll start with mm, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look, I think we probably know what we have. Um, and I think there's been enough opportunities for players to go, yep, we've actually got the right ones. And as I said, probably the, the discussion was around that um, backup batter, I guess, from a top order perspective, whether he plays or not. So the Will Young, um, Chad Bowes sort of situation as a backup. I mean, Finn Allen will come into that mix as well as a potential backup. Um, you know, but I, I think, you know, got to look at, at experience. When you, when you lose someone like Kane Williamson, heading into a World Cup, uh, I don't think you can turn up with just um, promising players. I think you need to have mm. some players in there who you know, as Dooley alluded to, can actually deal with those big match moments, you know, and, and have done it enough to have confidence in that. Um, and that's where, you know, I keep going back to a guy like Martin Guptill. Um, you know, we, you know what you're going to get from, from Guppy. He's also done well in, in Pakistan in recent times. Um, he, he obviously wasn't taken on this tour um, I th I'm not sure if the team was picked before Williamson was injured or not. Um, if it was, then it made good sense in terms of trying to find that, that other explosive opener. But I think now is the time to go, look, we've got seven games. Let, let's get Guptill back in the mix. If he finds anything near that form that we know he can have, then he at least provides that experience with Conway at the top. Um, and then you've got to find that, you know, whether it's you, Will Young at three, whether it's Daryl Mitchell to continue in that spot. Those are discussions you have, but I just don't think a World Cup's the time to experiment, um, you know, especially when you've lost a player of Kane Williamson's experience. And, Dooley, that's the general consensus, I think, from most people I've spoken to in cricketing circles. A World Cup is not where you experiment with new players. Yeah, spot on. And, and look, um, I, I think we all... Well, we we go to a situation. I don't know with this, the selectors, and, and Hess, you've, you've been in that situation. Are they... You know, are they going to go back to Martin Guptill? Do they have owns to admit that they were wrong and, and go back to, to, to Gup and, and say, we need you? Because they were wrong. Uh, they, they did them far too early, in my opinion. And it's just an opinion. Um, and, and I'm not saying it because you're sitting there, Laura, but it's just, you can't, you know, experience is one thing you can't get off the shelf, you know. You, you, you've got to have it. And, and the loss of Kane is massive. It, it, it is huge. I think it's taken New Zealand from a, a semi-final prospect to very, very fortunate if they get anywhere near because he is that good a player in these conditions against spin through the middle. It, he, is, he was going to be one of the keys from New Zealand's point of view. So maybe gain some experience back at the top of the order. And that's why I would do exactly what Hess is talking about. But do the, do the selectors, you know, do, are they prepared to do it? Are they prepared to sort of admit that they were wrong and go back and do it. So that would be where I'm at. I, I don't mind Will Young at three. I, I know that, you know, there's that, do we go and a, a spin a short with Phillips, um, Mitchell and Bracewell, which I would like all three of those. 
those in my slow bowling and and spare options to go with a uh, Will Young at three and maybe Mitchell at four and then have the sort of the batting, the Phillips, um, the Bracewells, the Santners, those guys come in and after that. So, and do they go back to Trent Bolt? Those are the big calls that are going to have to be made, and I believe they're the ones that should be made. Yeah, and the big calls that need to be made quite quick, because as I say, there's only seven games until this World Cup mm. kicks off, and only three of those are in conditions semi-like what they're going to deal with in India. The others are in England, which I don't think is much like India at all. Haven't played a lot of cricket in either, but I'm going to go ahead and suggest <laughs> as such. Um, so, here's take us through what your, uh, at the moment, your World Cup squad would look like. Okay, I was hoping you were going to put it up on the screen, Laura, but I'll, I I'll do it, it off for the cuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, look, I, I would go. Um, look, I would go. Uh, Gabdul, Gabdul Conway. Um, I would go. Will Young uh, in the squad. I'd go Mitchell. I'd go uh, Latham. I'd go Phillips. I'd go Satner. I'd go Bracewell. Um, I'd have Nisham in my squad, uh, and then I'd have uh, Bolt, Southey, Henry, uh, and probably Milne as the four the four quicks. Uh, and then I'll probably have um, – so Phillips is your backup keeper. So and then I'll probably bring Chapman in as your other sort of power player through the middle if you needed to make a change through the middle order. So that would be my would be my 15. What are you thinking, um, Dooley? You in agreement to that or is there another player you'd like to see in there? No, we've had a sort of a bit of an email chat over the last couple of days. And, and, and Hess and I are very much on the same, on the same boat, I think, as far as the, the 15 – are concerned it's just around what we do with a starting 11 and um and we, we, we can you know the debate was sort of around the will young coming in at three for me and, and then mitchell at four and and probably leaving sody out of my starting lineup because i think that philip santner uh and, and bracewell can can kind of do that job if we if we uh, and then your seam bowling starting lineup is, is henry Salvi and um uh and bolt that, that's how i would start it and so santner would be batting at number eight for me which gives us a really good long batting lineup um, and it gives us plenty of bowling options as well I'm noticing no Ferguson in either of your 15 there um, he's just, just yeah. Dooley couldn't fit him in getting through games I, I think getting through 10 overs is probably my issue with him and I think it probably just means Milne is slightly in front of his. is that how you read it yeah, look, I'm the same. I think if Ferguson's fully fit, yes, yes, I think so. Um, it, it's just a risk, you know, when you've only got potentially one backup seamer. Um, look, Lockie's done incredibly well, and, and but it is a matter of, of some consistency. And even four-day, even T20 cricket's been a bit of an issue in terms of staying on the park. So one-day cricket mm. where you've got about three spells. Um, as you said, if he's fully fit, yes. No problem, but if not, then I think Milne's a, a nice a nice backup to have there. Uh, yeah. I, I think the yeah, I mean the Will Young one. Um, look, he's probably because he's got the ability to bat one, two, and three. Probably takes over from someone like a like a Finn Allen, who's a, a very fine T Twenty player, but probably hasn't quite found the, the tempo yet required in, in ODI cricket. Um, you know, Chad Bowes has, has got some opportunities, but he probably hasn't grabbed them. And I think Will Young is. Is a is a nice player, uh, and he, as I said, he's got that flexibility. So um, that would be that'd be the reasons behind behind that. Dooley, um, we've had a conversation <laughs> Hess and I uh, prior about who would captain this side. So we've had a look at um, Tom Latham and the captaincy role over in Pakistan. But then, of course, we've got Tim Southey as the other senior um, player, is also, of course, the the Test captain. Who would you like to see captain that side in this World Cup? No, now with no Kane. I think um, Tom, I, I'd still go with Tom. I think just bowling captain in ODIs, the, the things happen very, very quickly. And I just think that the guy behind the stumps is probably in a slightly better position to, to captain in an ODI situation because of the, the pace of, of things happening. Tim's going to be uh, quite a crucial component um, as far as the bowling is concerned. I just feel that Latham has probably got my nod in the white ball situation. So, his, how, going forward, when when it does come to, to making these decisions, when New Zealand cricket do it, I mean, you've been in a situation where um, you've had to pick a, a World Cup squad. What, what will the process be, and how do you think they will factor in what, what um, Dooley was saying about, one, maybe admitting they've got it wrong, and, and two, having to really acknowledge this whole franchise cricket thing, because Trent Bolt might be the first, but I, I, I hazard a guess he will not be the last in, in what's coming. <laughs> 
Well, I, I would have thought, and I'm, I'm sure it has happened, that that discussion with Trent Bolt will be well advanced already. I mean, I don't think it's the sort of thing you come knocking at the last minute because it does change your plans drastically in terms of whether he plays or not. So I'm sure those conversations are well underway, um, you know, whether it's through David White, whether it's through um, Gary Stead, whoever it is, um, you know, they need to make that, that decision and, and find out whether he is or isn't. Uh, that's probably the first thing. Um, the other one is, is about, look, they would have had a plan in place for the last couple of years, I'm sure, around what the side's likely to look like. And it's a bit of a moving feast. You know, you, you, ha you constantly have check-ins and, and talk about, you know, is the pecking order still the same as it used to be? Um, have we got more information uh, or intel on the conditions we're going to play? If we have, does that change our thinking at all? So you'd like to think those discussions are taking place all the time. As there are injuries, obviously the pecking order changes potentially. Is the balance right? You know, do we have, you know, enough all rounders? Do we have enough bowling options? Do we have a backup keeper? Just the basic stuff. Um, and then it's about um, there's probably about one or two positions that are really up for debate. The rest of it will be really straightforward. Um, the the Gupta one, the gu the goalposts have moved. You know, originally if they had Kane. They had Conway, they had, they had Lathan there. They had, they had enough experience um, so they could potentially afford a little bit of more of a punt at the top. Um, I'm not so sure they do now. So I think it is, as Dooley said, just accepting, hey, things have changed. Um, maybe, you know, maybe our position a wee while ago um, needs to change as well. And we need to just take that on the chin and go, look, we actually need a little bit more experience in these conditions. Uh, you still need to set the innings up in, in India. Uh, it's not... It still swings at the top uh, for the first few overs, so you need some real batsmanship. It's, it's not a matter of just going out and, and swinging from the hip. Um, you know, you, you need people that can play spin against the new ball as well and potentially attack it. So who are our best equipped to do that? So, you know, for me, uh, we've got a guy who's, who does pretty well in World Cups, uh, ODI World Cups, and, and he's ready to go, and I don't think he's over the hill just yet. So... That would be probably the second conversation to have after the uh, after the Trent Bolt one. So, Dooley, you've watched a lot of cricket of late all around the world. You've watched a lot of the big name players that are going to feature in this World Cup in one team or another. To your mind, who do you think is already the front runner to make a semi final in this World Cup? Well, um, look, you, you can't discount India at home uh, in their conditions. Pakistan are playing some very good uh, white ball cricket. Their bowling attack is is fantastic. Uh, and if you know Bubba continues to sc score the runs that he uh, scores, they're, they're going to beat a lot of sides. So the subcontinent, the other two strongest subcontinent sides. Um, I don't know that Sri Lanka are, are in that sort of realm anymore. South Africa, I think, will be a force there. I think they've got the players well equipped to play in these types of conditions. Uh, they would be another team. And then England, England got the, the sort of the depth in 50-over cricket as well as 2020 cricket that um, I can see them competing very well. They've got bowling in their top six, seven, and they've got batters that can, um, you know, that can genuinely find the boundary. And then raw pace. And I think that's going to be one of the keys as well, play, play a big factor. We, we, when we think subcontinent um, tournaments, we, we often just think spin. But Hess is so right. You know, the ball swings. It still swings at the start. So... The Sirajas and, and these types of guys, Trent Bolt, they're going to have a, a role to play um, if and when required. So don't just think that spin takes control. It's certainly, you know, the quick bowl has certainly come into play. We've seen it throughout the early parts of, um, of the IPL as well. Some that don't have uh, a lot of grass on them and, and that will play into the hands of, of the spin bowlers. But there are, you know, there's enough different... Uh, types of conditions, I think, right around the country that we're seeing throughout the parts of this, this IPL, that, that seam bowlers will have a part to play and it won't be all about spin bowling. So you've got to have a fairly balanced side. Those are the four that I would, I would look at in these conditions straight away. South Africa, uh, England, Pakistan and, and India would be the throw an early, you know, throw the early names in there. I love it. I love a good early name in a hand. I've never been early for anything in my life, so it's, it's exciting for me. But, Hess, um, you're spending a lot of time with one Australian, Glenn Maxwell, who's found some form uh, off the back of an extraordinary leg break. I don't know how he's come back sort of the way he has. But would you throw Australia in there? Or do you think that they're too Yeah, I find this really matches? difficult. I find this really difficult, Laura, but, yes, I do. Um, just I see, I see Mitch Stark, um, the fact he 
how he bowled against India over here in that last series. Um, as we said, he, he swings the ball up front. He takes new ball wickets. Their batting lineup. Uh, I think if you you take Love of Shane out of that, you've just got you've got Smith, and then outside of that, you've got a huge amount of power. Um, I think they're going to come into it. I'm, I would probably have them in ahead of England. I think almost England have probably gone over the hump a little bit um, in, in terms of the, a lot of their players are kind of at an age where they've they've had tremendous five, six, seven years. Um, have they got enough new guys coming through would be the question. Harry Brooks obviously won, but outside of that, it's sort of the, the tried and true. So yeah, I, I would I agree with South Africa. Um, I would just potentially place Australia ahead of England. Um and yeah, that would be the only the only difference I'd have. Oh, terrible. I find it really difficult to say as well, but yeah. Yeah, well, it's yeah. difficult to hear. I'm not going to lie to you. Yes. <laughs> hey, Dolly, you have commentated on a lot of world tournaments, and I'd love to know your ODI World Cup moment, your favourite ODI World Cup game that you've been a part of, that you've watched over the last couple of World Cups. Yeah, um, I, I had a sort of a long, hard think about this, and. Um, I came up with the the England, uh, sorry, the India New Zealand match in England, and it was one of those games that just you, you sort of felt New Zealand fought and fought all the way. That partnership and Ross, you know, Ross batting overnight, the, the run out the next day. There was just so much going on in that game. We had them, I think we had them six for ninety, and. and Game was done and dusted. I mean, they would have been sitting in the change rooms going, Oh, we're home here. And then just Deja and Dhoni put a partnership together, and all of a sudden, Oh, we might lose again. It was a really cool one to call, I thought. It was one of the worst games to watch as a fan, I'll be honest, because there was stress. <laughs> and I remember walking round after the second day of the one, the two day one day, walking round the boundary, and the Indian fans were so upset, you know, because it was so obvious at certain mm. points that India had that in the bag. Hess, what do you remember of that game? Do you remember watching that, thinking New Zealand have got this? No, they haven't. Yes, they have. Oh, we're going to bed now. We'll come back tomorrow. Yeah, well, I was actually working in the Indian studio at, at Star. So mm. overnight, you could obviously see the wicket was still doing enough. And, I mean, the Indians were very confident. And then the next morning, they basically – I know we were only batting for just under four overs, but they, they backed off and gave us pretty much a run of ball. And we ended up getting another 28 maybe, and, and 240 became the target. And once again, it was sort of – the talk was like, oh, we'll knock this off in 40 overs. But – you know, there was also the talk from the cricket side of things going, actually, this wicket's not as easy as people think. And there's a little bit of nibble in this. And if, if the new ball bowlers get this right, you know, things could change really quickly. And um, that's why I sort of thought the fact that India backed off that, that second morning was, yeah, was, was probably a, a point that they missed and, and would look back and, on reflection and go, geez, we probably gave them an extra 15 or 20. Um, and then the way, obviously, Henry and, and Bolt started with a ball was... Uh, was outstanding. Obviously, the Nisham catch um, oh. to get rid of, of DK was was exceptional. Um, but just it just had enough nibble in that wicket the whole time to sort of keep the seam bowlers interested. So it was just a heck of a match. And as I said, I was sort of there riding the waves with the the Indian supporters, and obviously they knew where you know where I where I was supporting. <laughs> that Dhoni run out though, I will mention it because for oh. obvious reasons. But my lord, the Who line between one? professional and personal got very blurred for me for a minute there. <laughs> when that run out, I nearly died. It was just it, and yeah. some iconic commentary came off the back of that. Obviously, with one Ian Smith um, and Dooley, you got to be a part of that. You guys are doing a brilliant job over there. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Dooley. Great to have you first up here on No Boundaries. Now we know that you'll do it. You will. You'll never leave. So. So sorry about that. I'll be back. I'll uh, be back. <laughs> perfect. Uh, you guys take care. Here's all the best for the rest of the tournament. And same for you, Dooley. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Laura. Cheers, Laura. And thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back next time on No Boundaries.